Um, good afternoon and welcome to the Ecology, Evolution and Conservation Biology Seminar Series. Today we have Dr. Andrew Dobson here with us. He is a professor in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department at Princeton University. His research focuses on the ecology of infectious disease in endangered and fragile ecosystems, including the Serengeti in East Africa, the coastal salt marshes of California, and the forest fragments of Malaysia and Bangladesh. Dobson also works in conservation and is interested in the ecology and economics of land use change and, and wildlife human interactions. Finally, Dobson works in the field of theoretical ecology to understand the links in human, domestic animals, and wildlife disease systems. Dobson has a recent publication in Science about the current pandemic titled Ecology and Economics for Pandemic Prevention. Without further ado, here is Andrew Dobson. Great. Good afternoon. It's uh, super to, uh, well, I wish I was there, but anyway, it's a great honor to be asked to, to speak to you, and uh, I hope I can visit Oregon eventually and, and get to meet you all in person. What I'm going to talk about today is preventing the next pandemic. Uh, and I'm going to touch on three different aspects, the ecology, the, the economics, and evolution that might occur once these uh, endemics get started. Um, essentially, the initial chunk of the talk, as I say about ecology, and, I, and I'll talk about some earlier things we've done, looking at the mechanisms that go, give rise to emerging diseases. I'll then briefly look at some of the uh, stuff that you mentioned in the paper that came out this summer, on the economics of emerging diseases, it's straight away acknowledging that it's, it's already out of date. The economic figures need to be readjusted because this economic, this epidemic is even bigger than we thought when we first wrote the paper back in, I guess it was April, May, we wrote it for it to come out in June or July. Finally, uh, I will talk a little bit about evolution of emerging pathogens because it's something we should begin to get concerned about and I'll give you some insights from a different system we've been working on that. So if we look at disease emergence, uh, and I know David Quarman talked a little about this, we can divide it up into different sections. There's the sort of pre-emergence when, when diseases are circulating out in wild animal populations. There's the actual process of spillover. So quite a lot of what I'll talk about will be the process of spillover and how that might occur when that leads to emergence and the disease starts spreading in human populations, how that can sometimes remain local or what happens when it begins to get epidemic and eventually pandemic. And at the end of the talk, we'll, we'll come back and, and, and look at what's the relative costs of stopping the epidemic at different stages and, and what are the costs to humans and the, and the global economy as it progresses across this screen and gets to the pandemic stage. If we start off looking within that spillover process, uh, about a decade ago, a group of us uh, headed up by, by Jamie Lloyd Smith, but they, the, most of the people like Jamie were all postdocs at the time. Uh, there were a few aging specimens such as myself on the paper. We wanted to look at this initial process of spillover and try and get at what do we understand about the dynamics of it. And one of the crucial things obviously to focus on there is what is the rate of spread for those pathogens that manage to move over from their wild or domestic hosts into humans? When does that rate of spread get to this magical figure R naught when an early infected individual managed to infect other individuals? And if that individual infects more than one interval, then we would, individual, we would expect the disease to start increasing. If R0 is less than one, then the disease is bound to die out because not enough people are infected by each infected people. And we wanted to see how that varies for different types of zoonotic diseases, which would be pathogens shared by wildlife and domestic species with humans. So one of the things we did was to, to look at all the literature on that. And when we looked at the number of published studies, this was, was of the order of about 800 studies at the time, there were a lot of papers, which are just about circulation, of different zoonotic diseases in their natural reservoirs. There were many less papers on cross-species spillover, even less papers on the, the, the human to human transmission at the early stages for these uh, zoonotic diseases. And also, similarly, low numbers of paper on pathogen evolution, 
quite simply because these are rare events that are only occasionally observed. So it's not going to be a great thing to make your career on because you're sitting around waiting for it to happen. Which of course instantly begs the question, well, how often does this happen? And the bottom line there is we get a spillover event that begins to take off in the human population roughly at the same rate as which we have presidential elections or elections of prime ministers and presidents in, in, in Europe. So about every four or five years, we get an event that we should be concerned about. My colleague and friend Mark Woolhouse has put together a more detailed figure that suggests that every year we get two new viruses in human populations from uh, reservoir species, new species we haven't seen before. So roughly of those two every year, one in 10 takes off to create an epidemic. So it's not a rare event, and it's something that's going on at a relatively constant background rate. So let's look at some of those different processes. We can divide them up, and what I'm going to talk about is what role does agricultural intensification play? More specifically, we're focusing on agricultural intensification as it relates to fragmentation of natural habitats, forests and savannas, converting them to agricultural land and how that process leads to emergence. I'll then talk about the role of the wildlife trade and also a bit more subtly about what, how do rates of, what are rates of exposure likely to be and what role does immunity potentially play in stopping outbreaks? So, if we look at the pathogens that have jumped across, there's a whole industry of people making maps about them. They consider those maps to be predictive, but I think that's a nonsense because essentially diseases have jumped over on every continent and not at a predictable rate in different continents. So, so the maps tell us where we've seen outbreaks in the past, but they're not particularly predictive. They might tell us about where we might need to be concerned, or we might need to make the maps in a different way. And there have been a whole bunch of pathogens, both in history, many of the biblical plagues were just pathogens jumping from early domestication of uh, cattle and dogs in, in, into humans, through to things such as the Spanish flu that emerged at the end of the First World War, which may have been because people were on low planes of nutrition after the First World War, or it may have been because we slaughtered all the horses in the First World War and we lost the immunity to influenza we get from having high exposure to horses. More recently, we've had, and we continue to have, outbreaks of new influenzas. We're still constantly worried about that. And most of our pandemic preparedness, for what it's worth, is focused on what's the next influenza gonna look like, but more recently, as I said, we've seen things like MERS and SARS, which like COVID are coronaviruses, and quite disconcertingly, things like Nipah virus and Hendra virus, which, which I'll talk about next, which in many ways are much more virulent than um, uh, COVID or even influenza. One common theme that seems to link together lots of the things, the Nipah and Hendra viruses that I'll talk about, SARS, and Ebola are bats. Lots of these new pathogens that we're seeing seem to come across from bats. So that suggests it would be nice to know a lot more about the diversity of viral pathogens in bats and why so many pathogens seem to come from bats. And we'll start by looking at that. Uh, and again, plainly, we have to talk a little bit about the political response. I am in getting back to COVID, but I'm gonna talk about some other um, pathogens first, because I, I'd hate to be uh, uh, out uh, competed by COVID. These are some of my favorite bats. These are the teropid fruit bats, the huge big bats that split off from the sort of smaller bats we see around in the US and most of the rest of the world. These bats are mainly in Southeast Asia, and some are, are, are the Eidolon bats in, in, in Africa. They're huge, they, they live in big colonies, they can fly around diurnally, uh, people actually go fishing for them because they're so big, they make quite a nice meal. So people fish for these with kites, with fish hooks on kites, and they'll just put up a, a, a wall of kite string and fish the bats out of the air to go and eat them. And one of the bottom lines of this lecture is uh, eating bats may not be good for you, no matter how hungry you are. If we look at the, uh, the ranges of the, the, the fruit bats, surrounded in green are the teropid fruit bats, 
surrounded in purple, the, the Eidolon bats in uh, Africa. The one place the Eidolons and the Teropids overlap is Madagascar and the, and the Comoros Islands. Uh, and and the, my student, Cara Brook, who I'll get back to, has been looking at the viral pathogens of those bats in, in Madagascar and the Comoros. My first exposure to these bats was actually in Malaysia, where early on in the Ecology of Infectious Disease Program that the National Science Foundation set up in about 2001, uh, Peter Dazak and I got a grant to go and start looking for emerging diseases in Southeast Asia. And we decided to focus on Nipah virus in Malaysia uh, and, and up to Bangladesh, and also with Raina Plorite on Hendra virus in uh, Australia. Both of these bats, both of these viruses have fruit bats as their reservoir species, and they both emerge around about the same time. Nipah virus in Malaysia, Hendra virus in Australia. This indeed is the first site that Nipah virus was recorded from. This is a farm on the peninsula of Malaysia. It was uh, first located at a place called Ipo, and this was a pig farm there. Uh, restrictions have now been put in place because they had to kill every single pig on this pig farm and put up these really scary signs to keep people out. And you can see how efficient they are. The letters are already sort of falling off after about uh, a year after the outbreak. This is something you almost never see. This part of this is Peter Dazak when he still had hair and he looks as if he might be infected with a virus. That's probably not the case, but the person he is standing next to is a patient zero. This is one of the first people infected with Nipah virus. Luckily, he survived. He's one of the farmers working on that farm, but he still shows indications of long-term damage by having been infected. He's a very good guy. He just doesn't move as readily as he used to be able to move. This is uh, another thing. This was the first epidemiologist who was called into the farm about this disease outbreak once both pigs started getting sick and bats started sick. This is Dr. Chang, who identified the first Nipah virus as something novel and that was going to cause huge problems as it was infecting humans, some of whom were dying at about a 50-60% rate if they were exposed, and pigs, which were also dying. So what they did was to call in the authorities and completely destroy this pig farm. And indeed, they destroyed every pig farm in the Malaysian Peninsula. And what Dr. Chang is holding up is actually a mango fruit. Pick this up from the floor of the barn because mangoes are crucial for the between species transmission in this case. This is a fruit bat hanging in a tree and it's eating a mango. Now, keen types will observe that this mango is too big to fit inside that fruit bat. And indeed, if it were to eat even a smaller mango, it would affect its aerodynamic properties because bats don't want to fly around with large pits from mangoes in their stomachs. So what they do is they just suck the nice juicy mango fruit out until they've got all the juice, and then they just drop the, the pit down below them. They're in the forest, it lands on the forest floor. But what they've done in Malaysia is to build shade for all their pig barns by planting mango trees about them. Uh, so this is uh, doubly beneficial for the farmers. It means they get mangoes as a crop and they get pigs as a crop, and the mango trees shade out the pig barn so that the, the pigs don't overheat and also the pigs get a dietary supplement from the mangoes falling down into the pig barn. The one catch in that is if a bat's already fed on the mango it may be infected with Nipah virus in which case it's going to affect pigs with Nipah virus. And so what we did was to catch lots of bats setting up sort of aerial mist nets for bats and survey them for uh, prevalence of Nipah virus and you can see from the serology, bats that have been exposed but may no longer be infectious, more than half of the bats in the Malaysian peninsula test seropositive for Nipah virus. And the other thing we learned from this bat is that from this survey is we put satellite collars on the bats as part of Jonathan Epstein's PhD thesis. And the traditional colonies where these bats go to roost, where everyone says, oh, we've had a colony in the village for ever since my grandparents' time, there's a colony there, but it's different bats every night. 
these bats travel over huge areas. They'll go from Malaysia down to Sumatra, down across to Java, across into Sulawesi and back up to, to Malaysia. The population is completely panmictic with the bats moving around and mating with other bats in other colonies. So the bat, the distribution of the virus is relatively a homogenous right through Southeast Asia. Now, what we've got here is some work that my student from the Poly Park Project, Juliet Pulliam, did. Juliet was looking and trying to reconstruct the epidemic of Nipah virus in the bats. She started off by getting hold of all the data from Ipo, this is Nipah. Ipo is the little village there where, where, where the virus first emerged. The gray areas are the abundance of pig farms along the Malaysian Peninsula. And this matching map is the abundance of mangoes. Again, matching closely onto the pig farms because the mango trees, as I said, are planted to increase the shade around the pig farm. You can see that both of these industries, the pig production and the mango production, took off being major source of agricultural revenue for uh, um, Malaysia until we get this outbreak when both of them get knocked down uh, and essentially they had to restart everything from the pigs. They didn't knock any of the mango trees down again. They just had to protect the pigs better from the mangoes. Now what Juliet did as well as putting all that data on the agriculture together, put together data on the dates of onset of illness of pigs in different pig barns along the Malaysian Peninsula. And she found an interesting and consistent pattern that there were often little outbreaks in individual pig farms of pigs being sick for periods of up to two years before there was suddenly a major outbreak. And this is the major outbreak that happened two years before we got there when all the pigs were destroyed and indeed Malaysia was closed off from pigs to go to Singapore and indeed to the rest of the world. And that was all that there were these little mini earlier outbreaks before the main outbreak occurred. So did she decided to make some models of that? Classic SEIR models for susceptible, exposed, infectious, and resist recovered and resistant bats. And what she showed is if you introduce an infected mango into a pig bar, you'll get an epidemic and it'll most likely die out, partly because the infected pigs either recover or die, or they move in and slaughter lots of them. However, if you subsequently drop in another infected pig and another infected mango, you get a different pattern because you induced some form of herd immunity by first infecting the pigs and having the, the disease flow through and then letting it die out. When you introduce a second infection, instead of getting a huge epidemic, you get a much smaller epidemic and the pathogen persists in the big farm. Now that's a bit disconcerting. It suggests that the dynamics of the pathogen will be very different in a population that's been primed by earlier exposure th th than it is when you get a virgin epidemic. Now the other student on this project was Raina Plowright. She was based at the University of Davis. And being Australian, she wanted to work on Hendra virus, which is a sister virus, the Nipah virus, in bats in Australia. Hendra virus had done a similar thing. Instead of spilling over from bats into pigs, it spilled over into horses. A vet was called out to look at these race horses because they were sick and they're very valuable as they were race horses. The vet then got sick with symptoms that were very similar to Nipah virus. So people felt that the vet had got Nipah virus. Tragically, he died. When they did the serology, they realized it was a subtly different virus, but very closely related to Nipah virus. And that pointed the finger to the teropid bats that they have along the coast of Australia, in the world's oldest rainforest. So Rainer went there to start looking at bat colonies and doing similar things, surveying the bats in those colonies to see what the instance of Hendra virus was. We also talked and she started talking with Juliet and making simulation models. And she found, this time thinking of the pathogens in the bat, if you look at the relationship between the proportion of individuals in a population, be it bats, pigs, or horses, that are immune when a pathogen is introduced, then you get two big effects. 
one, if there's very few immune individuals, you get a very big epidemic in black, but it dies out quite quickly in red. As the proportion of hosts that are immune gets bigger, obviously the size of the epidemic gets smaller, eventually not being able to establish at all once you've heard immunity is established. But just before you get to herd immunity, the duration of the epidemic is much, much longer. So essentially, there's this intriguing trade off between what's the level of immunity in the population, how big is the epidemic, and how long does it last for? And it's not the biggest epidemics that last longest, it's those that occurred just before you reach herd immunity and the pathogen's about to die out. This time is off. Juliet continued to work on that and essentially said there's this interesting relationship that if we look at what the magnitude of R0 is, the rate at which the pathogen would spread through the pig barn, and co to compare that with um, in the initial epidemic in blue versus once an epidemic has occurred, it's much more likely that the pathogen will persist if you've had this initial immunological prime. Hold that thought in your head because we're gonna come back to it later. She also showed that if you look at whether or not an epidemic will take off, that is very crucially dependent on the ratio of the duration of infectiousness to the duration of immunity. So if you plot out a graph of that ratio against R0, then all the major diseases that have caused pandemic in humans and in wildlife, bovine December in seals, SARS, rubella, measles, they tend to fall in that area where they have an R naught above one and a relatively short level of infectiousness to a long duration of immunity. And again, you can see that illustrated for those different diseases there. The higher the proportion of immune, the longer that duration of the outbreak occurs that allows the thing to persist. So that sort of looks at agricultural intensification and one class of viruses that emerge from bats. The second thing I was going to look at as a cause of outbreaks is habitat fragmentation. And the best way to get a feel for that is to go to uh, the Brazilian Amazon. So this sort of movie takes case roughly across the time scale of my career. It starts off when I was an undergraduate in the 1970s. This is what's been going on in Brazil through my postdoc years, early faculty years, eventually having a steady job. We've slowly been losing the Amazon. It's been chopped up and fragmented into lots of tiny little patches. And the thing that characterizes that is a the release of carbon up into the atmosphere, which is a big problem, but the fragmentation of forests into little patches. So as the perimeter of the forest has become substantially longer than it was when the forest was intact, and essentially the only perimeter was along the edge of rivers. So oops. if we look at this effect of forest fragmentation, this time in Africa, and where there have been outbreaks of Ebola, very nice paper by a group of French scientists, you can see that the areas where all the outbreaks of Ebola have occurred are all along the areas of forest at the edge of where they're being cleared and where all this fragmentation is going on. So that suggests Destruction of forests is crucial to some forms of pathogen emergence. And we see this with lots of vector-borne diseases in the Amazon, but those, those are older diseases rather than new diseases. But it also appears to be a problem with these viral diseases. Uh, so we, a group of us got together to say, well, let's look at this interaction between habitat fragmentation and habitat loss and disease emergence. So a bunch of us got together. We initially went to NC in Santa Barbara and then went to Sisink in, in, in Annapolis to look at and develop a, a set of models that looked at the relationship between habitat fragmentation and pathogen emergence. Now we can make a cartoon of that. Essentially what's going on is you have, we assumed a forest, but it could be a savanna that's slowly eroded until it completely disappears. It's converted to what we call matrix, which is usually agricultural land. Uh, which as you lose forest, you increase agricultural land. But the crucial thing you have is that your perimeter, 
the edge between the agricultural land, whoop, agricultural land and the forest is at a maximum when you're at about 50% conversion. And if it's the edge that's crucial for disease transmission, then that would initially suggest that disease transmission between whatever's in the forest, whatever's gonna get into the agricultural land will be at a peak at intermediate levels of habitat conversion. Now, if that's a fractal area because it's gone into lots and lots of patches, then this perimeter will be a much higher and sharper curve. And so there are various different functions you can use to explore that. We can then make relatively simple two host species models that assumes that there are species that live in the forest, generic species in a forest that lives in the agricultural habitat. And we can either have density dependent transmission, the transmission rates are dependent on density, and the relative rates of between species transmission go from being exactly the same as they are within species down to point, you know, 5% of what they are bet between species for within species or we could have frequency dependent transmission in the same way. But the maximum is always at 50% conversion, but the curves have subtly different shapes depending on the ability of the domestic species to transmit disease relative to the um, wild species. Now, when you make stochastic, when you make models of that for the disease, notice that it's possible to get a disease transmitted from wildlife into domestic livestock at anywhere from about 20% transmission out to about 80% transmission. But a more important and subtle point is the size of the epidemic you're likely to see doesn't peak until you're out at about 80% transmission. And that's because you'll get a bigger epidemic if you have more domestic livestock for the thing to spill into or more humans in the forest for it to spill into. So a stochastic model always increases, but once you get to about 60%, it becomes bimodal. It's bimodal because you're losing the reservoir species really rapidly, and so you lose their pathogens. But if something does spill over, it gives you a much bigger epidemic than you would have got at the sort of crucial 50% maximum perimeter area. So that again is an important thing. So the relative sizes of the epidemics you're likely to see changes as you convert the land to a different extent. But any form of land conversion is always increasing your risk. So that's the thing we worry about. We then would sort of say, well, what sort of species should we be worried about in these forests that might be causing diseases to spill over? And this is a nice, wonderful paper put together by Kenan Olivo, who, who's been working with Peter Zazak at the um, yeah, um, Go Health Alliance, Jonathan Epstein, who was initially a graduate student on the project, is also on, on, on this, uh, on with a bunch of other people. It looks at different groups of animals and says, if we look at the relative numbers of viruses recorded from them, what proportion of those are known to be zoonotic, and which species groups should we most worried about? Now, the slight problem here is the ones we should be most worried about are the ones we know most about. And so it's distorted by the numbers of studies already done. And plainly, the things that tend to be domestic animals, the things with horns and hoofs, the cattle, which have wild analogs, are the things we've known most about. And we've already had many unpleasant pathogens from those, but I don't think there's a lot more we haven't had yet. So this would be things like measles and uh, rubella. It's the bats and the rodents, and potentially the primates are more of a worry because the ones we've looked at have got lots of scary things, but we've only looked at a relatively small proportion of the hosts and host species and only relatively small numbers of those. So what the Eco Health Alliance people do can begin to put together relative risk maps for different groups of hosts of where their pathogens are likely to spill over. And this is the overall map. It points massively towards South America, particularly the Amazon region, mainly because that's where most of the world's bat species are, very high proportion of bats there. But in fact, we haven't seen a lot of disease emergence in South America yet, or maybe there are differences in the way humans interact with livestock in South America from other regions, because most of the areas we think things spilling over have actually been Southeast Asia, 
a little bit in the Middle East, and of course to Africa where we've had HIV and Ebola. So these we know come from primates, and as I say, bats. So using these maps is perhaps useful for knowing where we could go and look to start making libraries of what the genetic diversity of viral pathogens looks like, but I don't think they're gonna be very powerful ways of looking at relative risk. Now, the other thing that the uh, emerging diseases strongly points to is, is the role of the trade of wildlife. Uh, it was very thought to be really important in the beginning of COVID. We're still trying to tease out where COVID actually emerged. Uh, the bushmeat trade was very important for both um, uh, HIV, possibly also important for several of the outbreaks we've seen in Ebola as well, well as far as fragmentation. And so it's something we should genuinely be concerned about and be monitoring much more intensely. Now, the wildlife trade is vast. It's one of the biggest sources of trade in the world, after sort of arms and oil and, and several other things. The way we monitor the wildlife trade is through CITES, the International Convention for Trade and Endangered Species. Trying to get a handle on CITES is tricky because they have a huge task and a pathetically small budget. The, the annual budget for CITES, which is monitoring the fourth or fifth biggest area of trade in the world, is under $6 million. That, that, that is less than 30 seconds trade fluctuation on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so it's got, you know, it's an uphill battle to do anything with that small amount of money and a relatively small number of people. CITES does now have a website where you can look at some of the data. It's just recently been updated, but not, not, not sufficiently recently for me to upgrade the slide. So this is CITES up to 2015, when you can see a number of important patterns. What I've looked at is just the trade going through Singapore, partly because there is no biodiversity in Singapore that enters the trade. There's essentially no biodiversity. So what you're seeing is an index of international trade. And these are transactions. So it's not just an individual animal or plant. It's a case full or a plane full or a boat full of a particular animal. And straight away, there's two things. These are just the data of transactions going to the USA on the left and into China on the right. Now, there will be reporting biases, but this says to me, if we look initially at the USA, CITES was set up in 1976. It takes a while to become an efficient organization. So it takes until you're up into the early 80s for CITES to actually accurately monitor the trade. And then we see relatively constant levels of stuff coming into the USA. I've divided it up cumulatively into things that are on Appendix 1, Appendix 2, and Appendix 3. Appendix three is the least concern. Appendix two is very important. Appendix one is the things of most concern. So there's the least number of things that are appendix one, but these are things that we really shouldn't be trading at all. It's a bit dodgy even to be doing two or three because they're species of concern. What you see if you compare China to the US is two patterns. One, China's trade increases and doesn't, hasn't yet peaked out. It's increasing because China's economy is increasing and more and more people can afford the luxury goods that are in the wildlife trade. But even when it begins to reach its current peak, it's still an order of magnitude less than the stuff going into the United States. Now that might be a real effect or it could also be a large component of underreporting. Uh, it's also reflecting different species. Lots of this is stuff from people hunting, people going into the sort of uh, um, the, the luxury trades, furs and jewels and things like this. Lots of this is medicinal things as well as increasingly the luxury trade. But there is a huge amount of stuff going on. As I say, having $6 million a year to monitor this is pathetically small. And this is just one trading center on the planet of which there are many, many. Now, there's also an important difference between the international trade, which creates the potential for viruses, bacteria, 
other pathogens to be moved internationally. And then the trade that goes on within countries, which is usually for food. It goes on within countries and within regions. So this is within China, but sometimes coming in from outside. This is data that the Peter's, Dezak's people at the uh, Eco Health Alliance put together for teropid bats and macaques, monkeys in China, sampled over the last two or three years, looking at the numbers of bats that they actually sampled going out with people who were collecting bats for food, the number of macaques sampled with people going out to collect macaques for food, taking a blood sample and then seeing how many novel viruses could they identify in those samples. And this graph, once you've got your brain around it, should scare you witless because it says, if you're working in the trade, taking bats to sell them in a city, and you sample about a thousand bats a year, which you know if you're selling them at four dollars each or five dollars each, is not going to keep you very healthy. Uh, you know, it's not going to keep. You're not going to be able to send your kid to Princeton on that salary. You will have been exposed to about fifty novel viruses. If you're doing similar numbers of primates, and you're probably doing less, but you might be exposed to 100, 200 novel viruses. So this to me says the people working in the wildlife trade are massively exposed to novel viruses, huge numbers of them. Now, the average person working in the trade is gonna be exposed to 50 to 80 novel viruses a year. And if they're working in the primates, maybe a couple of hundred. Now, why are we not, and so it says we were really unlucky with COVID, or why was it different from all these other viruses? Or are these people exposed to so many viruses that their levels of herd immunity, is, uh, of immunity are so high that they just don't get sick when they get exposed to a new novel one. And if they don't get sick, they don't transmit it on. But it also says, or is the process that Juliet looked at, this immunological priming working, so these people have the things and are just carrying viruses around, waiting to transmit them to people who haven't had this level of exposure. So again, there's a lot we need to know there about how these pathogens work. It also says, as I say, it goes back, there's something weird about bats. And I'll skip over that, but we've been trying to get at why are bats different? And what is the immunological difference between a virus and a bat? and then a human or a cow or a dog. And I'll point you towards that review by Kara Brooker. Now, what do we do to stop those processes? Deforestation, the wildlife trade, how much is that gonna cost? And how does it compare with the current cost of the COVID epidemic? Well, we did, as they put together a paper in science this is the classic boring slide that don't write all this down. It's very hard to read. So we've redrawn it as a diagram. Essentially said, what are the things you can do to stop the trade? Obviously increasing the funding for monitoring the global trade. Instead of spending $6 million on CITES, we should be thinking much more of the order of 600 million at least. Uh, so CITES could do a better job. Reducing spillovers and being able to detect those, again, could be done for 50 to $100 million. Anything that gives you early detection would be really, really useful. Better management of livestock would be really, really useful. Reducing deforestation. So we did some calculations based on what happened when they stopped deforestation in the early years of this century in the Brazil, in the Amazon, extrapolated them to other parts of the world and look to different relative costs of doing that. You can then subtract from those costs the, the CO2 sequestration benefits. So these are costs that are reduced by the fact that you're reducing the amount of carbon dioxide going up into the atmosphere. And you could also try and find ways to stop the wild meat trade in China, which is the biggest cost. It's of the order of 18 to 20 billion dollars. So it, it, it's a big cost, it's a lot of people employed, but China is already making moves to do that. These are all the costs which of course have an additional benefit, and then particularly from the perspective of conservation of biodiversity and also from the perspective of slowing global warming. We can compare 
the costs of doing those things with the cost of the epidemic. So hold those figures in your head because uh, here we can just see those relative costs in here. I, I forgot to switch this slide around. So the biggest cost is reducing the meat trade in China. That's much more expensive than actually reducing tropical deforestation. But the Chinese seem to be moving towards to that. We can compare it with the cost of COVID. This is not to scale because when we plot this to scale, these are the costs of everything we have to do to prevent an epidemic occurring. These are the costs of COVID up until May this year. There's the loss of GDP, which is up at around 5 trillion, and three different estimates for the costs of human lives lost, depending on whether you have a high, medium, or low value to human lives, because the economists and statisticians have different ways of valuing human lives. But whatever it is, these two figures add up to about 18 trillion. This is the annual cost of doing something to prevent that. So the relative prevention being less than cure couldn't be more sharply illustrated than in this figure. Uh, we could put it in two dimensions. So this is the annual cost of preventing it. This is the damage from COVID up until April. We now know it's at least twice that. So putting money into these things would be easily the best thing we could do to prevent them. And there would be huge benefits from doing it. What are the sorts of things you could also invest in? Well, one of the things that I think it's really vital to invest in is veterinarians. We always think of emerging diseases as being a human disease problem, but the people who usually detect them first and are most likely to be working on them are, are, are veterinarians, the, the tiny numbers of wildlife veterinarians, but also the people who are working with domestic livestock, cattle, ducks, chickens, pigs, all around the world, we can look using a data from FAO in Rome at what's the relationship between the size of a country and the number of veterinary staff they have. Luckily, the, obviously, the bigger the country, the more vets you have. But as with any of these relationships, the interesting information is in the scatter around the line. I notice on a log scale, and this is a, it tends to bend round. The slope of this is 0.855. So the really big countries have proportionally less vets. But if you look at the scatter around the line, this is just saying, what is the relative number of veterinary staff per citizen against area of the country? And you can see there's a huge scatter here uh, with about four orders of magnitude variation in the density of vets. So the USA is up here, roughly compatible in the number of vets to Brazil and Australia. Venezuela actually has more vets per person than the USA. The places that have the most vets, uh, ironically, are places like Spain, uh, Chile, Cuba, of course, uh, Canada has nearly twice as many per capita vets as the US. The best place to have a sick pet, it turns out, is St. Martin in the Caribbean. The worst places or the places we should be most worried about emerging diseases appearing because we don't have the veterinary people out there to check for them are very much sub-Saharan Africa and also to some extent Southeast Asia. Papua New Guinea is the worst place to have a sick budget. There's just hardly any vets there. Two important data points missing from this graph are China and Russia. We have no information on the number of vets in China and Russia. We know that the few wildlife vets in China, less than 10 of them all work in zoos. So there's very few people in China actually out there looking for viruses or working on wildlife diseases. Now, getting to control these things, as we said early on, we realized we were not doing particularly well with this. Can we speculate into the future? Just in the last five minutes, what I'm going to talk about is, is COVID likely to evolve? One of the things we do as epidemiologists is to think about pathogens evolving. The thing you originally get isn't in a host it's been in before, so it is going to change. In what way is this COVID likely to change? And I'm going to give you curious insights on that because COVID has similar properties to another pathogen that we've been working on. 
another emerging disease. In this case, it's an emerging disease of birds, but the mathematics, we've looked for that, the, the, the mathematics is sort of taxonomy neutral. It doesn't matter if the host are a bird, it doesn't matter if the, if the pathogen is a bacteria, the mathematics can generalize. So if we look at COVID, it has begun to mutate, but all of the mutations that have been detected so far are neutral. They're all in neutral genes and they're not coding for anything. There was a report this morning that there's a mutation that appeared in Spain at the beginning of the summer that's actually taken over most of the COVID strains in Europe. We don't understand why that would happen. It could be everybody going to Spain and getting it and taking it home, but it may have some subtle transmission advantage. But all of this just reflects neutral variation in COVID, allowing you to sort of see where the strains that have got into different countries have come from. And an important thing to note here is the strains that got into the US, some of them came in from China, but most of the strains circulating in the US actually came in from Europe because COVID got to Europe much before it got into the US and was spreading particularly in the sort of skiing and the soccer fan community. And some of that through the business world brought it into the US much more rapidly than it came into China. So closing down train and plane links to China happened too late and it wasn't a big source of COVID. Now, this isn't a particularly scary thing. This is a house bench sitting literally outside my window. We've been looking at parasites and house benches for about the last 20 years, partly because they have an emerging disease. Um, these are the natural habitats of house finches. They're actually a bird species that lives in the Sonoran Desert. They're, they're, they're southwestern US specialists, but they were introduced into Long Island in 1940. Like any invasive species, it took them a while to get going. And, and curiously, they count as an invasive species in the US, in the eastern US, even though their natural range is in the western US. But they did start to expand. And in 1993, they picked up an emerging disease from what circulates as a very common pathogen in domestic life and in poultry, Mycoplasma mygaliceptica, which is of course a bacteria. It's not a, a virus, but it's a good model as an emerging disease because A, we know when it started, October, 1993, just outside Baltimore, and it goes into a host species which nobody cares about. So nobody tries to stop the epidemic, which means we can monitor it and see how it spreads. And indeed, we can see how it spreads because there are fanatical ornithologists in the US who collect data on birds visiting their bird feeders. So there you can see the radiation of house finches and then something happened then. this disease emerged and knocked them back. And in fact, let's just go back and run this again. What I want you to watch is this is the house finches in the east expanding in abundance. When we get to 1993, which is about now, a disease emerges down here and it knocks back the abundance of the house finches. So the disease has emerged and now it's spreading across the US and will eventually get into the endemic non-invasive population in the west. Now it's a great pathogen to look at because we can see if birds are infected because their eyes swell up. And it's not just me who can see that, uh, the 50,000 people who are volunteers at the Lab of Ornithology in Cornell can report 30 times a month whether or not they see sick house finches coming into their feeders. So we can actually watch the geographical spread of this disease as it moves from its origin down here on the Delmara Peninsula out through the invasive range of the house finches spreading as sort of laminar throw and eventually going across to the western US. Now it's a great species to work on because the birds are a pest in vineyards. Initially this is a problem uh, when you get wine from upstate New York because it used to taste like vinegar. Once the birds get to California we get really nice uh, Pinot Noirs that are almost as nice as the ones you have up in Oregon. The good thing about COVID is that they can now convert New York wine into hand sanitizer, which, which is a wonderful use for it. And the hand sanitizer is actually quite pleasant to sort of sniff. Now you can see the impact of this virus on the host population. 
These are just counts of average counts of birds coming into feeders in Virginia, Maryland, and uh, Delaware, or Pennsylvania and Eastern New York. When the disease emerges, it reduces the house finch population by about 50%, killing about half a billion house finches in the world. You can monitor the level of sickness of the disease as the eyes get more and more swollen. So when we bring our birds from the vineyards in, we can infect them and see their eyes getting worse and worse. So we can visually see the virulence on the outside of the host and eventually it clears up and the bird gets healthy again. The most important point of this, you know, about this digression is that if we look at how infectious the bird is, by either putting birds in that we know are infected with uninfected birds and directly measuring transmission or sampling the eyes of the bird with a, with a calibrated filter paper so as we can count the bacteria, you can see that its ability to infect increases very, very rapidly, but we don't see symptoms of infection from the eye score of how badly is the eye swollen until we pass peak transmission. So in that way, it's very, very similar to COVID. The dynamics are you can transmit, you can transmit, you can transmit. You start showing symptoms. The symptoms get worse, but your ability to transmit goes down. And eventually, after about 12, six weeks or so, you recover, enter an immune phase, and then eventually use your immunity. That's interesting because it makes it similar in this figure to what I think was a sort of crucial figure uh, explaining why it was easy to control SARS and smallpox and really hard to control influenza and HIV. This is a relationship between R0, the rate at which the disease spreads, and the proportion of infections that occur prior to symptoms occurring or when you have asymptomatic infection. And of course, it's very hard to control influenza and HIV because lots of transmission goes on before symptoms appear. SARS was easy to control because symptoms don't appear until the person is infected. So when symptoms appear, the person's only just becoming infectious, and that's also the case for smallpox. Now, we could see with the house finch disease that one thing that occurred with it is that as we connected and looked at different strains that, that, that began to appear in the population, brought birds into the lab, did experiments on them, that it was evolving to become more and more and more virulent as it spread on the East Coast. It then spread to California, and became much more mellow, as we all do when we go to California. But once it became endemic in California, it also began to get more and more virulent. So we saw evolution working in two directions, of an initial population on the East Coast that evolves to become more virulent, one strain goes across to the west coast, it initially it's milder, and then it also evolves to become more virulent. So we get this going on. We can make models of that. As I say, the, um, the uh, mathematics doesn't differentiate between birds or humans or um, viruses and bacteria. We just have dynamics that you're susceptible, asymptomatic and infectious, symptomatic and infectious, and recovered. And the one more thing I want to say is, well, can we use this to make a, a model of the evolution of virulence, where you can have relative levels of virulence when you're asymptomatic and infectious and relative levels of transmission and relative uh, and different levels of, uh, of virulence when you're symptomatic. What that says, you can derive an expression for R0, but you can also do a, a, an adaptive uh, evolution type model it has the disconcerting result that says, depending on whether transmission occurs before symptoms occur, e.g. before the number one on this axis, what is the evolutionary stable state of virulence? Beanie, get out of here. That virulence will always increase the more transmission goes on before symptoms appear. And that result generalizes for any pathogen. That's a disconcerting thing. If transmission occurs before virulence is expressed, then the ESS, the evolutionary stable level of virulence, will always increase as virulence expressed later on, once the symptoms occur, then it's likely to select for lower levels of virulence. 
And that's effectively what we've seen going on with this pathogen in, in the US. The second effect you go, why did it switch around once it got to California? Well, essentially, the rate at which virulence is expressed or it, it evolves speeds up as levels of herd immunity appear in the population. And that to me is the most dangerous aspect of this whole idea of using herd immunity as a way to control the disease. Once herd immunity has arisen, you may be able to control the disease, hopefully better than we've done at the present time, but you'll also be selecting for more virulent strain. Okay, on that happy note, there's a message from the birds. You should be, herd immunity is not a viable strategy for controlling disease, as it's likely to select for higher levels of virulence. So what have I tried to say? Well, if we focus in here, we can look at the proportion of different pathogens that have managed to make it from circulating in wildlife through this pathogen spillover. That's the blue line, and it's always a very, very small proportion that have come across and managed to become pandemic. The relative costs of doing things to stop it are really quite low and massively low compared to the cost we eventually have to pay trying to stop it once it's come across and the cost we're having to pay from its economic impact. As I say, if you compare them, these figures are already out of date. This 11 trillion, we now know is closer to 33 trillion. These figures are high, but they all have benefits. In particular, pandemic prevention is good on a multiple levels of fronts for both conservation of biodiversity and also for slowing climate change. So there are huge benefits to doing this. If we do it, we need to do it internationally. It's international collaboration that has allowed us to make all the progress we've had with COVID so far. Getting rid of things like WHO is a big, big mistake because the collaboration between the scientists is what's brought it all together. I'll finish just by acknowledging all the wonderful people I've worked to on different aspects of this. And again, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to address questions. Thank you, Dr. Dodson, so much for your lecture and seminar. This was really informative. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. Um, so the first question comes from Christopher Cousins. Uh, he says, I'd like to know your thoughts on the land sharing versus sparing debate. You presented, uh, presented evidence that edge effects increase the risk of zoonotic disease outbreaks. How should ecologists weigh this risk into the decisions to either preserve large tracts of land for wildlife or maintain connectivity in a matrix landscape? That's quite a big question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that's always, it's almost a question from a different seminar. I, I, I plainly think that, 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 that obviously the, the big international intellectual challenges uh, uh, of this century is working out how we're going to feed all the people on the planet while also conserving as much biodiversity and preventing future pandemic outbreaks. And the land sharing and land sparing debate is at the center of that. Uh, I think you want to not see that as a, a unitary yes or no thing to do. I, I think, and there's also the various nature needs a half, nature needs a quarter, nature needs a third. Uh, organizations which are sort of career enhancing businesses to my mind what we need to do is sort of divide the world up into four types of areas both to minimize disease risk which increasingly now i hope we see is an important thing to do and to be able to feed people and i think of those as quarters but they could be different relative proportions but i think what you're going to have to have is set aside a quarter of land that it's purely for biodiversity, wilderness areas with minimal uh, use for humans to ever go in there. Partly you're gonna need that because humans are entirely dependent on water. We're dependent on that more than anything else 
and it's soon going to be worth more than oil, gas, radioactive, whatever, only if we set aside a significant area of land, which I'll call roughly a quarter, as forests uh, and mountains will be able to catch enough water to keep any form of human enterprise going. So we have to do that. You then want half the land for agriculture that you split into two halves. Half of it is sharing land. So the sparing land is the first quarter, the sharing is the next quarter, where you have very low intensity agriculture, the, the sort of nice hippie agriculture, which is shared with wildlife. You're not going to have many carnivores on that land. So you're going to have problems with herbivores are eating your crops. So you're probably going to have to have hunting there to eat those uh, animals as a source of wild game. And you're going to grow your crops in a relatively low level, you know, not intensive agriculture. You then want a quarter or significant area for intensive agriculture, mainly to feed the people living in the final quarter, which will be cities and manufacturing and the human economy. So, so the most important thing we can do is suck people off the land, have intensive agriculture to feed them, but then leave at least half the planet as a mixture of low level agriculture and entirely for wildlife and for viable sources of water. And if we can, those figures will always be imperfect and different in different locations, but I think doing that will also allow us to be able to minimize disease risk by keeping the sort of fragmented lands at a massive distance from people and, and stopping that essential fragmentation of lands to convert them to new agriculture. We need to just use the land we've already converted much more efficiently. The next question is from Michael Hansen. He asks, how is the first incidence of the house finch epidemic identified so precisely? Um, we, we caught it really, really early. It, it, it was like the, the, they're in uh, the um, lab of ornithology in Cornell, uh, where all that work has, has been based, has a um, feeding, bird backyard feeder project that, 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 that's been running before the disease occurred. And people would just uh, essentially monitoring what birds are coming into people's feeders. And we were partly using that to look at the expansion of house finches, but just looking at variation in bird numbers from year to year. And people started reporting uh, seeing sick house finches. And it was sufficiently early that we could identify where they first started seeing them. And we know that was somewhere on the Delmara Peninsula. Uh, by going in and getting genetic samples, we, we could then begin to identify one of the farms from which it was likely to come. Uh, and there's an irony there that, that you can, you don't, you can have a backyard poultry fog, uh, which doesn't count as an industrial uh, poultry herd flock uh, until you have more than 25,000 chickens. <laughs> so you can have up to 25,000 uh, chickens as pets and, and sell them as healthy uh, reared um, biotic chickens. Uh, it only becomes an industrial operation once you get above 25, 30,000. So there's lots of uh, small backyard uh, poultry uh, um, farms like that on the Delmara Peninsula. So this, that you know, creates the risk of exchange between domestic livestock and wild species. The interesting thing is, it literally only come across once. We did have a second strain appear in upstate New York about 10 years after the first strain, but then there was so much immunity in the house finches that it instantly died out. So, so we've only ever detected a second strain passing over from domestic poultry once. Uh, the other very cool thing is if we take the strain that's now present in house finches and try and put it back into chickens, it dies instantly. It just can't live in chickens anymore. And, and that's a sort of, there's a cool additional part of the story that deals with why I can't sometimes survive. Okay, we have one more question from David Little and Anna Joles. Uh, vaccination. I know Anna. <laughs> She's my student. <laughs> oh, perfect. Um, vaccination is just another way of achieving herd immunity. So are you concerned that a COVID vaccine will boost virulence 
and why don't all vaccines or do they? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think we might call that the $64 billion question. Uh, um, it, there is, and this fabulous work by um, Andrew Reid and Sean Nee, uh, looking at Newcastle disease in chickens, that, that, that vaccines may potentially be selecting for increased virulence. Um, the, the, the catch, that might stop that happening is we don't know how long immunity is going to last for with, 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 with COVID. The data we're beginning to get suggests it might not be very long, uh, which from the evolution of virulence sense it, it, it is good news. Um, it's um, not so good news from the vaccination point of view because it means we're going to have to vaccinate everybody every year or everybody will take the vaccine every year. Uh, similarly, we don't know how much people's immunity might be topped up by being um, reinfected once they've been exposed once. Uh, and it may well be that that, that, you know, it, 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 that that actually helps us. If they don't get us sick the second time, that might actually help us get, get a better control on this than trying to vaccinate everybody. But you know, again, we go into an area we don't know enough about yet. Another question from Matt Betts is, do you know how receptive uh, policymakers have been to the message in your science paper from this year? Uh, bits of it have sneaked into one of the presidential candidates' speech. Uh, I couldn't possibly say which one. Uh, 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 one of the uh, conservation organizations uh, in Washington has been lobbying hard for that. Uh, it's, it, it's always hard to have any influence on, on, on policy. Um, the, the, the strongest way to do that is, is to actually deal with the media. Uh, the politicians, as you will have guessed, listen much more to the media than they do to the scientists. But if the scientists can get their message into the media, then the politicians come and start talking to the scientists because they want to know how to deal with the media. Uh, and so, you know, this is a case particularly where it was really, uh, as the pa pandemic started to spread, the politicians really needed to listen very sharply to the, to, 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 to the, to the scientists. And Anthony Fauci has done a brilliant job of getting his message across. Similar things have happened in the UK where, where you've got a very good bunch of scientists on the, on the SAGE committee. Uh, but increasingly there, the politicians in the UK are getting very nervous about listening to the scientists. And then that you can see from the scale of the epidemic in Britain that they should be listening much more sharply. Okay, well, thank you so much for presenting and talking to us today, Dr. Dobson. Um, we want to remind everybody that, one moment. Nope, share. Oh, sorry, it won't let me share, but um, next week we will be having uh, Dr. Susan Jarvie from the University of Hawaii, Hilo, talking to us about rat lung disease. And we hope that you will return. Thank you again, Dr. Right. Dobson, nice for taking the time and talking to us. Hi to Anna, good to see her, her good, good question. All right, ciao, super to meet you all today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. Thanks very much, Andy. My pleasure. That was great. That was an excellent talk. All right, I'll sign off. I'll be in touch in a sec. Okay. Thanks, Amanda.